welcome back to that thousand bit podcast. Great to be back with you guys. Uh, I'm here with a fascinating person today. Someone I've kind of known for a long time, but we don't know each other like super well. So this is going to be a really fun podcast for me to find out more about her. Her name is Sarah Williams. Um, Sarah, I know basically through CrossFit Hollywood, through my friend Andy Thompson at CrossFit Hollywood. That's how we first met. And Sarah, I don't know if you know this, but you took a photo of me in the ocean a while back, and it was my like IG photo for a long time. It might still be my IG photo. I don't even know. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> photo. Uh, Sarah is an awesome photographer, but um, she's a really interesting person, and she has this uh, this uh, quote on her Instagram. And I'm going to read that quote to start because this is what's going to this is what's going to sell you guys. Uh, the quote is: "I aim to inspire change." through athletic nature experiences. Um, so in a second, we're going to delve in with Sarah um, and we're going to find out what she means by that and what her what her life looks like. But first of all, Sarah, welcome. Thanks so much for taking the time. I know you're a really busy person. So welcome to the Paris World Pick, Paris Pick podcast. Amazing. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Did you have a good Christmas? I did. I visited my mom in Washington State. So it was my first white Christmas, actually. Oh, it was? Yeah, it snowed the whole time, several feet to the point where we're having to shovel out, you know, the road for the cars and just she has a cabin. And so it was really beautiful. Just like look out the windows and to see the snow. And I tried cross country skiing for the first time, which was pretty amazing. Also, how much, yeah. of, how much of a cardio workout was the cross country skiing? How much what? How much of a cardio workout was the cross country skiing? Oh, it is. And that was kind of the point because I'm doing a lot of endurance training right now. And so in order to keep the endurance, it's like, well, what activity can I do that fulfills that? And so cross country skiing is perfect. And so you, you get into a rhythm with your heart and your body and you just go. <laughs> awesome. Um, if, if anyone wants to look at your like Instagram page, they would think to themselves, my God, this person has this incredible life. I want that life. How do I do it? Um, <laughs> So let's let's just go back and let's let's talk about I know I know photography is basically your your career that's that's how you make money and stuff but your kind of like passion is way beyond that so um, why don't we just go back and t- tell us tell the audience like a little bit about yourself um, how you came to this place how you came to be a photographer and then how your kind of like your vision kind of widened into everything that you do now. What what a question. Yes, <laughs> you are. Yeah, I mean, I've been interested in photography my whole life, um, just from a creative expression and um, a beauty seeking expression. Um, And it wasn't until later in life that I actually found a passion for athleticism. And it was um, the merging of those two that really kind of is where my life exploded and started to take off. Because I didn't grow up super athletic at all, actually. I didn't find any love or passion in that until I discovered CrossFit actually. Um, And then getting kind of in shape and doing obstacle course races. And um, I didn't love traditional gyms, but I love this idea of functional fitness and and how it applies to being in the world. And simultaneously with CrossFit, I started doing outdoor nature adventure hikes. And um, my first backpacking trip actually ended in search and rescue. So it it wasn't like a love at first sight kind of thing. Um, but from that experience, I, you know, learned everything that I could about surviving in, in the elements just on my own with nothing else. And that kind of turned into a passion. And then, so I took the hikes longer and started, started doing longer trips. And so my first solo backpacking trip was 220 miles walking from Yosemite Valley to Mount Whitney, which is the tallest mountain in the lower U S and on that trip, I brought a camera and, um, I realized that the merging of those two things is exactly where my life was at because I had such a transformational experience um, coming to my athleticism, but then able being able to document it was really powerful and special because it wasn't just look at these pretty pictures. It was, let me tell you about my experience and here's my visual aid to do so. And so that kind of followed me and I've taken it to greater heights. And since hiking, I found alpinism. And so mountaineering has become a really big part of my life and one that has allowed me to have incredible experiences that when I'm on these experiences, I'm like, if if there was a way that I could share this with people, like the world would be different somehow, you know? And so the way that I've sort of set up my life is, is very non-traditionally, you know, I I make money in a variety of ways. And um, my biggest passion has come from sharing these transformational experiences with other people. And that takes several different avenues. 
Um, one of them, of course, is through photography because that's how I convince people. I'm like, this place is only a couple of hours from LA. Let me show you, let me bring you. Um, and then also in my pursuits into nature, I fell in love with cold exposure. And that was just from being in the mountains and jumping in and in, in a frozen lake at younger ages and realizing not even scientifically what was happening in my body, but just the visceral experience that I was having from it and how alive I felt and how it would help with negative feelings that I was experiencing. And just, it made me kind of come back to this internal clarity that I loved. And again, just so I'm like, how do I share this with people? Um, and well, so I just, yeah. I would like to that with you later because I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by that, but keep going, keep going. Yeah. Um, there's so many different avenues. Um, and then, so I've, you know, had all these experiences and just really wanting to share them. And so in 2019, I actually started a company called Adventure Fit, um, whose aim is to inspire, educate, train, and then guide people on outdoor experiences. Because I, being in a gym community and sharing on social media, I'd come back from different trips that I would have. And people would be like, that's so amazing, Sarah. I could never do that. How do you do that? And knowing where I come from, I would look at these people who were in better shape than I was. And I'd be like, you could absolutely do it. And like, no, 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 I'm too scared. I, could, I don't even know where to start. And I was like, okay. And so like after enough time, I would just say, let me show you. Cause there was people I cared about. And I wanted them to also have these experiences. They're stuck in their job. They're maybe experiencing depression and they don't see another way to live life. And so just take a group of people through a several week in the city experience. And then at the end of each of these journeys, I actually take them on a trip. Yeah. And this is what I love about that because yeah. we always say like everything you do in here prepares you for everything you want to do out there. That's that's the point of the gym. And stuff like CrossFit, it being a functional fitness thing, you know, starting out that way. Um, some of my early mentors were climbers, um, you know, specifically like Mark's White. And it was really you, you would do functional fitness in the gym to make you a better climber. So then when you went back to climbing, you would perform better. But it kind of like over the years, you know, it morphed into like the thing is the thing itself. So the, the sport of CrossFit became, but now we just spend all our time in the gym, multiple hours a day, and then you never do anything outside because you're too busy just training for the gym. Um, so with what you're doing, you're, you're almost taking it back to its origins. It's like, no, 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 no. The point of getting fit and healthy and strong in the gym is so that in the real world, you can do shit. Which is, you know, which is exactly. <laughs> what's the point? Which I think we we lose sometimes, and we lose it. Maybe we just get so obsessed with like my, my numbers in the gym and my performance in the gym, or maybe it's the aesthetic thing of being in the gym, whatever it is. But we do, if we're not careful, we do lose that 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 purpose and that connection to to what it was really meant to be about in the first place. Exactly, and it, and it's easy to, and it's it's not it, and it's hard to blame people for falling into that, especially, you know, in the, in the gym cultures, but it's such an untapped community. And I look around and there, I think there's a huge barrier to entry into the outdoors in a lot of ways. You know, people think they have to have the like expensive equipment or they don't know how to get permits or what's this whole idea about having to ask permission to go into the wilderness. You know, there's a lot of different hangups I think that people can have and, you know, the outdoor community. And one of the things that I love about it so much is that it's very much so built on mentorship. And so you learn from another human, you know, especially when it comes to sports specific stuff, you know, like climbing, usually you will find somebody who's a little bit better than you and then learn from them. And I just love that idea of passing down wisdom in yeah. various sports and the outdoors or, you know, a lot of people I've come in contact with, you know, have some kind of excuse like, oh, my family didn't really go into the outdoors. And so I don't know how and which is totally fine. You know, that's one thing also that I love is that at any age, at any skill level, you can find some kind of rejuvenation or fascination into the wilderness because that's our home. You know, that's what we're built from. Right, and, and that's that, that is the the crazy thing about all of this is like we have taken ourselves so far away from how we evolved. I mean, this, what what you're talking about, this is how we evolved for thousands of years. Exactly. Taken ourselves away from that, we've put ourselves in cities. We've created this artificial environment all around us. You know, especially if you live in LA, you see it. And then you become so detached from the world that you're talking about, you don't even know how to access it anymore. Exactly. When, in, when in truth, that's our natural state. So, yeah. you, know, you, you know, I mean, I mean we, we moved to Idlewild, and one of the reasons why we did that is because we, we wanted to reconnect with nature in, in a way um, and really enjoy, you know, the best parts of California 
as opposed to just being like stuck in cities and you know living that kind of city life um because i do i do think it's a completely unnatural state um and i don't think in truth i don't think we're really meant to exist in cities that the way that we do yeah you have to you have to make the effort you have to make the effort to to to, re- to reconnect to nature because if you don't you do end up in this weird space of like just city life and like artificial environments and just constant entertainment and in a in a very kind of shallow sense um without really experiencing anything experiencing anything real and especially think about it for my son for white and you know for my for my new my new kid coming it's like you want them to experience the real world and not just be caught up in this artificial environment that, that that's really only been around for the past kind of hundred years and which we built which we um we kind of take prescribed our own kind of doom by by building it um and it was like you know, isn't it isn't it great that we can build this and isn't it great that we can watch that and isn't it great that we can that technology can do all these things and it's like well yeah it's great but you know there's also the real world which is you know free <laughs> yeah extent, and way way more interesting <laughs> exactly and I think it's easy, you know, when you live in a city to feel like something is wrong internally. Like you, you, right. feel, you feel lonely, even though you're around people all the time, yep. or, you know, you just feel like something is missing or you just don't feel as alive because you're constantly berated from advertising people. You should be this, you should be that. And especially, you know, the, the hustle energy of LA, which is incredible for so many things, but it's just, if you're constantly in it, then you just kind of wear out and, um, I definitely think that that balance is needed. And I don't. I don't think it's a, it's a coincidence that things like depression and things like anxiety have gone up so much in the last hundred years. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious. Like you take yeah. people away, away from the environment that we were designed to be in, you give them a bunch of bad food, you give them a bunch of bad bad habits, uh, and you know it's not how we're meant to be. So then you think there's something wrong with yourself, and you keep you know you keep searching and searching and searching for answers. Like what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And part of the reason I think what's wrong with people is just that they are in this artificial world, this artificial environment that we, is not natural to us. Uh, we're not exposed to enough uh, nature and daylight and sunlight and uh, hot and cold and all these different yeah. variables that make us, you know, make our immune system strong and make us vibrant as, as human beings. Um, so I think, you know, what you're talking about is it's, just, it's so important because People will spend so much on therapy and drugs and all these different things to try and fix them. But honestly, I think a lot of the time the answer is so much more simple. Exactly. And what's interesting is that the recipe for everybody is so different in terms of how to experience nature. You know, like for people like us, I'm sure like athleticism or doing something like that and out in the outdoors is absolutely incredible. But that's not even necessarily for everyone. But I do believe that there is an environment and some sort of activity that involves the natural world that is the cure for almost anybody. But it takes a little bit of time for an individual to explore, to explore different activities, different sports, different environments. Um, I'm partial to the mountains, but I know so many people who love the ocean and water and lakes. And you have to take time and figure out like, where does you, where do you open up? What inspires you? Where do you feel relaxed? Where does your nervous system calm down naturally? And it's a really cool journey. And I feel like I've spent a lot of my life kind of figuring that out and allowing myself the time and the space to do so. Cause I realized pretty quickly how important that was for me as an individual. And so that's kind of been my life mantra is helping other people to find that for them as well. Did you, did you grow up in that environment? Not 100%, but there were little nuances. Um, my dad, his father was in the air force. And so he traveled all over the world and I would listen to stories of him skiing in Switzerland or speaking to a gardener. And when he lived in Japan, who would take care of the grounds and these little experiences that he had, that he spoke of, you know, kind of were, I just little seeds in my brain and in his later life, he suffered from depression and he had issues with alcohol and had a really hard time um navigating all of that but I grew up in Las Vegas Nevada and we him and I would go to Red Rock Canyon occasionally and when we were there I would see in him a softening yeah and I would see how he would escape you know the Las Vegas life and then just be out there and then feel at ease wow. and even though as a young person I couldn't quite 
understand the complexity of, of his psyche and the emotions he was experiencing, um, I just saw that. And I was kind of put it in my pocket. And then on my mom's side, she loved camping and, you know, she's definitely a hippie and all that stuff. And so she would take us camping once a year and she took me to my first trip to Yosemite and I couldn't appreciate it at the time. I wasn't fit or athletic. And so the hikes were hard and I, was, I think I'm sure I was uh, complaining at the time, but, you know, years later, even though at the time I couldn't appreciate it, it definitely left a mark on me in some capacity. And those two things, you know, as I, my consciousness evolved, you know, and I was seeking a healing myself, I looked at that and I was like, oh, interesting, you know, maybe, maybe there's something there. And so I just very started, slowly started to tiptoe into it. And then, you know, my whole world opened up from there. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I, cause I, I, I think about it sometimes myself and I wonder so often we end up back where we started. So I, I grew up um, on a small island off the south, uh, south coast of England and I grew up, you know, it's a seaside town, it's a beach town, but it's also, there's a lot of like nature, there's a lot of nature walks, there's a lot of uh, natural habitat, a lot of woodland, that kind of stuff. And I, I often just think to myself, like I've ended up back here because that's what, how, how I grew up. And that's what I like, that's what was familiar to me. And that's what I enjoyed so much as a, as a child. And mm -hmm. I've kind of like found my way back there. And I think that's, I think that's true of a lot of people. Like you were saying about whether if you're a, be a beach person or a mountain person, I think sometimes that that is to do with like childhood experiences and like Absolutely. associating like some kind of childhood pleasure with one of those or just a feeling of a feeling of happiness that you once had and you're just trying to recapture that 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 happiness um wherever that environment was um so it's an interesting thing i, I often but when i meet people in idle i always like to find out like where did you come from how did you grow up and then totally so, yeah you know well, Especially because Idlewild seems like a really intimate, small community. And I feel like people don't end up there on accident. It's very intentional when people are there. It is because, yeah, it is intentional because you have to realize there are kind of like sacrifices. Um, obviously, there's not many stores or shops here. You're not, you don't have the conveniences that you have of you know, living in the city. But everyone that here, I think, comes here because they do have a respect for nature and they do want to be closer to the to, to the natural world. They do want like a small community type of life. Um, I, I, I said to Emma all the time, I just love the fact that the members that we have in the gym are the same members that we meet in the coffee shop are the same meet, uh, members that we meet at the post office, the same people we see in the dark. <laughs> you, you know, you just get familiar with people, you have real conversations. Um, it's weird that, you know, you're in LA and you're surrounded by millions of people but like you were saying, there's a certain loneliness with that. And you can you can go a week without having a real conversation with anybody. Um, because it's just it's just not set up for that. You don't really have like neighbors or like the, the village. You don't have the village around you that you have in a place like this. Um, and it's um it's kind of it's really fun for me and really nice for me to get back to that. Because again, that's how I grew up, that's what I once knew. Um and to have that kind of like relationship, that those real relationships with people where I do like every day I have multiple conversations with people that I care about and that care about me and that you want to help. It's also a very kind of um, reciprocal helping here. Like I want the restaurants to succeed. So I push business their way. They want the gym to succeed. So they push business my way. And there's all kinds of little, whether it's electricians, whether it's um, construction, whatever it is, like there's a very reciprocal thing going on. Um, which is great, you know, it's just, it's just so nice to have those real, real relationships again. Um, so I do, I do think it's a, a special place. And I, I do think it is more, more natural because I think if you look at the way we evolved as, as humans uh, in our little kind of social bubbles, we had like our little societies or our little, little village, whatever it was, and, you know, you would have that communication within the village and there was a person that did this that would help you and a person that did that that would help you. <laughs> when we end up in these cities, there's just so much around us and it's just, there's almost too much stuff you lose exactly. those connections and those relationships and it becomes a big sprawling mess and i'm not i'm not convinced it's actually how it meant to exist but um it, it exists so that that that's something you just have to kind of deal with but this does feel a lot more real and a lot more natural and a lot kind of easier in a way um and to be honest with you like we have more friends here that we ever had in LA. And by friends, I mean friends that you like see regularly, that you have dinner with, that you have coffee with, that you have conversations with, 
Um, and, you know, it's, it's weird because it's far, obviously there's far less people here, but you see more, more people more often. Um, and again, part of it is because is you have the local village kind of mentality. Part of it is just because it's hassle free. You don't have to worry about driving 40 minutes, parking, and all the all the stuff you have to worry about in a city. Like you know how it is in LA. You have someone that you're <laughs> on the east, and you have a friend that lives in Hollywood. You got to you got to factor in. Okay, it's going to take us 40 minutes to get there. Parking is going to be a fucking nightmare. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you go through these things in your head, and then you end up thinking, oh, it's not worth the hassle, and you don't do it. You re- you really have to plan, and you really have to make an effort, and you really have to want to do it. Whereas here it's easy, like drive two minutes down the street, there's no parking issues, and you know, it's a real, um, it's just really easy, um, which just adds to the whole um, joy of it, to be honest. Um, but I, I think about when I, when I see people like you, and I, I can see in your heart what you love, I then think to myself, well, I wonder why she, I wonder why she stays in LA. Like, what, what about LA, like, keeps you there? But I guess, is it work or? Yeah. And that's an interesting question. Cause I, it took me a long time to find my friend group in Los Angeles. Mm. You know, I don't think that I'm, I'm not in the entertainment industry necessarily. And so, um, I kind of got, came to LA on accident, but then through the nature and the surrounding areas is what drew me. But what's keeping me here right now is the fact that there's a lot of people who I feel like I can help and, yeah. um, bringing and that- all- that gives, that, gives, that, gives, that gives you purpose and purpose i always talk about purpose on this podcast but purpose is such an important part of our lives and, and like again us moving here and opening the gym part of the opening the gym is like i want to make people stronger and healthier and idle well. that's my purpose here like the gym like financially is never going to make us a lot of money because it's just this yeah. business here to make that happen but do i think i can make 200 people healthier stronger um fitter mentally in a better space yes absolutely so that becomes my purpose and that's very similar to what you're talking about you know in your heart in la you could help a ton of people you know find a better version of themselves through these adventures yeah and exactly what you just said i think is so important you know if every single person could help their immediate community Mm. then i think the entire world would be such a better place you know i think there's this celebrity mentality or this follower mentality where it's like, get as many people as you can to, to hear you, listen to you, or like, like change the whole world. And it's like, yes, those are noble, noble pursuits, but the real impact is helping your neighbor. And then having that person help, like what you just said about helping the community of Idlewild, that's so incredible and noble and beautiful and amazing because you really are going to make a huge impact. And you are, you've done that even at Pharos in yeah. LA. And that's that's and honestly that's why that's why gym gyms are special. Like that's why Hollywood is special because you you can have that that impact that real impact uh, on the people around you. Um, and I do I do think that is one of the the gifts of CrossFit. To be honest, one of the biggest gifts of CrossFit is the the fitness is one side of it, but honestly, the connection and the community and all that kind of stuff and the ability to affect people in your immediate environment um, it is probably the most important thing out of everything. Um, and I think. Again, if anything, anything good came out of the pandemic, it was the real realization of the importance of, um, of the psychology of uh, social groups and that yeah. we, we need people around us. We are not meant to exist, you know, in this isolated uh, environment. Um, and the gym, the gym can bring people together. It can give you a sense of, um, a sense of community, a sense of purpose, a sense of um, collective energy um and all, all these things are just you know the the sets and reps and weights of, of it all is you know that's the least interest in the least interesting <laughs> part about fitness <laughs> people get caught up with that obviously with programming and this and what's the right program for this and what's the right program for that but honestly the magic of it all is is the connection and the the people and the the, the friendships and the relationships and, the, and that side of it um so that's that's really been you know, that's really become like what I love about it. Like, I, I mean, I, lo- I love fitness, I love working out, I love training, but ha- being able to build meaningful communities is really what, what drives the Ferris Project. Um, and I think most people that, that own CrossFit gyms would say the same thing. Absolutely. And this is obviously it's the same, the same thing we're talking about with, with you and what you're doing. Um, and then 
So with, with the with the, the company, the adventure fit company, how many like expeditions do you do a year? Is it like a regular thing or? Yeah, so it's seasonally based. And so I've mostly been working um, in summer and fall or kind of like the sweet spots, at least in Los Angeles. I do have hopes of doing winter expeditions, more mountaineering styles um, wow. a little bit later down the road. Um, but the way so it launched in 2019. And so we were able to squeak out, you know, I would say five different cycles is what I call them um, before the pandemic hit. And then it was a little challenging during the pandemic and then kind of getting back to it now. Um, but it's, it's a small intimate thing. And usually I'll work with a group of eight to 12 people because anything more than that, I think you lose that real intimate feel. And because the idea is to create a group of people who by the end of it, feel like a true family, um, kind of like that community in what you're describing. Cause one of my favorite things now is hearing people who were a part of it, you know, two years ago, who have developed friendships that help each like watch each other's kids now, or, you know, they've become something more because of how they met in in this program and have you ever done the Mont Blanc trail no I haven't I I would love to <laughs> would love that. so we did that um how was that that was 2019 I get right before the year before the pandemic yeah because Emily was pregnant so she could come so yeah it was the, it was uh, the summer of 2019 before the pandemic and um exactly what you're describing there was a relatively small group of us I think around 12 maybe 12 to 15 people, um, some are from the gym, and there are a couple of people who weren't from the gym, but we all kind of knew each other. But then when you go on something like that, you go on a shared experience like that, you you get to know people so much better, you get to form a bond, real connections. Um, you know, you get to rely on people and okay. you know, people in a way you, you don't get to do in your normal life. And you get to understand and appreciate people a lot more. Um, and it's amazing when you get there. I mean, we've had it actually in, in Idlewild when we've done the retreats up here. It's amazing how much people open up when you take them out of their like daily life and put them in a completely alien uh, alien environment. You have a glass of wine, whatever, and then <laughs> people really like open up and like almost like they're just they're almost desperate to tell you their story. Exactly, just to share. Yeah, not from a place. Hey. Oh, listen to me, listen to what I've got to say, but because it's like, it's almost like therapy. It's like, you've got all this stuff that's been building up for years and it's inside of you. You just want, you just wanted to talk. And for some reason, like you just felt too imprisoned to talk. But then once you take them to a, a completely different place, a completely different environment, people just open up and they share and they just, they want, they want to tell you, you know, they want to tell you their story. And that's such an interesting part about being human. Um, these people, um, obviously converse and, and, and not only tell the story but tell it in a way that reveals your you know your emotion and your how you, how you really feel about things as opposed to just like relaying information you're really like expressing you know this happened to me i think this is why it happened to me and this is what i learned from it and this is how i'm trying to improve and all that kind of stuff you know stuff you pay like thousands of dollars to tell a therapist <laughs> you you go you go and sit on a mountaintop you you know you put you you know you experience some extreme you know whether it's uh, an extreme height or extreme temperatures or whatever it is yeah. like, just in that vulnerable vulnerable and in a good way vulnerable place um and you're just like the, the shield comes down the walls come down and you're just like okay in this place i feel comfortable about just opening up Exactly. I mean, it's a very natural unfolding that, as you kind of described, that we truly desire. And especially when you're in nature compared to city life now, there's not there's no distractions. There's not a phone that you look up, you subconsciously grab. And then every single time you get to it, whatever intimacy you've been building with somebody you've had having a conversation with just goes down to zero every time. And so when you're outside or just away from technology, like that intimacy between the groups just builds and builds and builds because that's what we do as humans and that's how it works. And so if you just don't have distractions to it and you let it unfold and especially when you go through shared hard experiences and I think that is the key and you know being in an environment where you have nowhere to hide like if you're experiencing anger or if you're experiencing a tough situation you know everyone around you can see you but also support you yeah, and yeah. 
that feeling of being held by the people that you're with to get you through a challenging situation is so, I don't know, it's It's needed and desired and feels good. (laughs) It's so human. Like it feels so human. It's like, oh, this is to live. And then the phone thing is kind of fascinating because really so much is the phone's fault. Like we (laughs) we just don't appreciate how much is fucking us up. Like the amount of time, the amount of like, and Emily will hang up for saying this, but she gets so, um, like even when we sit down to watch something, like she's basically looking at her phone the whole time, because like whether it's like there's work emails coming through, there's, 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 um, there's the work chat with all our employees, there's, there's text, there's, there's all these things to distract you. Yeah. That you can do it authentically in the moment, unless you really make an effort to be that way. And again, that's the beauty of what you're doing is you're taking these people to a place where that shit doesn't exist. And when it doesn't exist, when it's not a possibility, the sense of breathing that you have, like you forget what it's... If, if you go out for a day and you you forget your phone, like you might have five minutes of like panic, like, oh my God, what if someone's trying to get hold of me? And then you have this like sense of karma comes over. It's like, oh, I'm free. I think it's okay. Yeah. Hey, and I'm completely free and no one can get hold of me and what a treat that is um and I'm a lot older than you so I, I mean I remember like I didn't have a phone until my 20s so I remember like growing up just you know you would just go out no one could get hold of you and you just didn't have that same anxiety around you like the the, the, the relationship between phone and anxiety is like they're like best friends yeah <laughs> It's just so crazy. And we're all like, and I'm I'm a victim of it as well. We, we all are. Um, and unless we make these like yeah. real purposeful steps to step away, um, it just it just imprisons us. Exactly. And then kind of going back to what we we're talking about earlier with like the cold exposure stuff, I the reason why I've been super drawn to it and I love it is because when you expose yourself to cold, your concept of time sort of changes a little bit. It makes you so extremely present that you kind of forget about everything around you. And I think that experience is the opposite of having a phone is because you're constantly like with it. But if you shield yourself from it and allow yourself to immerse in an experience that just takes you just to your core you kind of come back to that a little bit in a way. With your with your cold therapy stuff, how did I know you 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 were kind of inspired to do it because of your experience in the mountains and, and so forth? How did you then go about becoming like an instructor in it? Yeah. I mean, it was a, a lifetime coming, honestly. I mean, from an, a very young age, when I was experiencing like depression, I would go outside and just sit in the cold. And it really alleviated something within me. Um, And so just enough practice on my own into the mountains. And then once I realized how much it was helping me integrating it into my daily life, either through cold showers or buying a bunch of ice from 7-Eleven and a lot of self experimentation. And then um, I took a Wim Hof seminar and and learned a little bit about his methodology. And um, as soon as I learned who he was several years ago, I was like, I didn't even understand how that could be a life path and how sharing this stuff with other people, how important it could be. And to see how he did it, I was like, that's also amazing. Um, And so I actually started working at Deuce Gym in Venice with a woman named Kimmy Moss, who had a lot of experience with XPT, working with Laird Hamilton and Gabby Reese. Um, And so she kind of took me under her wing as my mentor. And I learned a lot through her and her methodology of how, like specifically you pair down-regulating breath work um, right before the ice bath and um, how those two work together, especially if you introduce this element of heat and just how many different protocols you can come up with, with ice, heat, and breath and how um, you can train for so many different scenarios, you know, just doing little nuanced differences with all of those three things. And so I took it more or less um, in a direction of resilience training and training for the uncomfortable and how to, um, not numb your emotions and how to be super present with what you're experiencing, um, more or less for the mental benefit and how that translates into adventure and how that translates ultimately into life. Cause all of that I'm doing in the adventure fit, you know, and my personal work is, 
um, yes, training for the mountains and training for hard scenarios, but it's really life training, you know, and, and, you know, I, I purposefully expose myself to these difficult situations in a way to then learn how to deal with, you know, the really hard stuff that happens in life that we can't foresee. And it's heartbreaking and challenging. And and how do you, you know, put your face on every day and go be a human in the world when you're experiencing these really difficult things? And how do you, you know, st- stand up for your community? And how do you, I don't know, come together? And it's, it's, it's all related. It's all related. Well, I've been watching, oh, I just, I just finished watching this, uh, this documentary on Disney uh, that, um, it's called The Limitless, it's with Chris Hemsworth, and he basically finds out he has this, this gene, this rare gene in his body that predisposes him to um, Alzheimer's. Like he's like 10 times more likely to get Alzheimer's than an average person. So he, he goes through all these different things that, that can help with um, lessening the chance of him getting Alzheimer's. And one of the things he does in one of the episodes is ice therapy. And there's a couple of things from that and stuff I've been reading one is like you can re- reduce the chance of Alzheimer's by 60% with regular ice baths, which is a phenomenal thing. Like that's more than any drug, I think. Um, and then I, I read this other thing where this guy got his testosterone levels up to um, 12, 1,200, um, which is a phenomenally high number. That's what you get if you take a bunch of steroids, basically, to get you to that, that high number. Um, 700 is considered like really good. This guy got up to 1200 not, with nothing else but but ice bath. Um, there's so much more information coming out, coming out how about ice therapy. What have been the things that you've seen? What aside from what we just talked about, obviously with um, you know, toughening you up for the real world kind of thing. Have you have you do you have any kind of like scientific things that you've seen or any proof that you've noted over the over the years that you've been doing it that, that, that people have like genuinely improved certain things yeah so i'm less on the the science end of it unfortunately um but just seeing people who begin to do it how their lives begin to change um physically i mean without changing another thing you you lean out a little bit yeah. and i know has to do with the activation of the the brown adipose tissue in your body mm-hmm. uh, and so it's it's very real visible to the eye without even having to document any data or anything like that um but then also you be, you get sick less i think it, it really stretches your immune system in every aspect of your body um and i've known people who are younger who have um issues with circulation and their heart and it stretches your system especially when you pair it with the the heat exposure as well um and then also not immediately jumping to one or the other and what i mean by that is getting into the ice getting out of the ice letting your body naturally warm itself up because it's in that stretch that your circulation and your system strengthens um, and then getting to the heat. And then same thing from the heat, jumping into the ice, allowing your body to naturally go there first without that inflammation. And so that sort of thing I've seen personally, like I didn't get sick for two whole years when I was doing it back to back. And that was actually during the pandemic, which I thought was extremely powerful um when when, was, it, when you say back, how often were you doing ice baths um so i would do it two to three times a week okay. and okay. um each time so minimum dosage um i would do three to five minutes in the ice each time okay. um, for the physical benefit but um i train myself for cold exposure because i'm often in very cold environments in the mountains up to negative 40 degrees and, you know, I, always, I think survival a lot. And so there's an, if there's a chance that I'm away from my tent or away from my sleeping bag and I'm on a really tall mountain in a, in a storm, you know, how can I, you know, keep my body safe? And so I would often experiment with doing up to 15 minutes in the ice, um, getting to a point where I just can get my body used to a certain feeling for long enough to the point where if I'm exposed in the elements for that long, then my body will have a more fighting chance to be able to survive. What temperature your, your ice bath is usually at? Um, upper thirties is what I aim for. Upper thirties. Yeah. And do you have, uh, do you just do ice in a bathtub or do you have a machine? Like a, I don't have a machine. (laughs) And so each time I do it, it is quite an effort. And so I'll, I'll go to different places where I can, 
um, jump into a circulating bath that already exists. But for, honestly, for the most part, I just do it myself. I have um, a blow up tub that I'll get a bunch of ice at a local store from. Um, or if I, um, when I teach, I'll usually do like an ice delivery or I'll just use a, a tub from Home Depot. Um, I do think it's quite amazing the technology that exists today to be able to get a nice, a cold plunge in your home. Um, yeah. But again, barrier of entry, you know, not many people have, you know, several thousand dollars just to spend on something like that, but that shouldn't stop them or you, you know, and so any way that you can kind of get yourself involved, especially with a little Ralph's discount card, which is our local grocery store here, you can get by ice for pretty cheap and the benefits. I I admit, I'm I'm pretty tempted to get, uh, it's called the plunge. Mm -hmm. So have you used one? Yes. Was it good? I, yeah, it's and the nice thing about those is that it's a circulating water. Right. And so the difference between that, so when you're in physical ice, you actually create a thermal layer above your skin. And so if you don't move, if you're in the ice, you actually stay warm relatively. Um, but the thing about the circulating bath is that the, the, the water is constantly moving against your skin. So any heat that you produce, it it takes away. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. a little and, bit more challenging. Cause I would like to get into the habit of kind of doing it daily. And if you are going to do that, like the whole going to get ice, filling up the tub, that's it's, just, it's tough. Right. It's tough. Absolutely. So yeah, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty tempted. I've been looking into it. Um, I just, I've been reading so much positive stuff about it. Um, you know, I'm 44 years old and when you, the older you get, the more you start to just want to live as long as possible and be as healthy as possible. Absolutely. Like trying to find all these different <laughs> things that can help and just everything i've read everything uh, everything i've experienced because we've been doing them um here for the retreats and so forth um, i know how good i feel and even even just and obviously it's not as good but even just going from the hot tub to a cold shower back to the hot tub to the cold shower like even that kind of hot cold therapy although it's not, not as extreme obviously you feel so good afterwards it's almost like it's just so like re-energizing it's almost like you like reboot exactly a reboot for the body yeah <laughs> and obviously the immunity thing is you know something we all want more of and I, it's been so weird this year because i wasn't sick at all during the pandemic like i never got covid to this date i've never i've never tested positive for covid but this year and probably because wyatt's in school he's bringing yeah, the- <laughs> I got sick like three times, like not, not like crazy sick, but like just like annoying colds and flus and shit like that. And it's like, what the fuck is happening? Um, and I, this year, everybody's been sick. Everybody's been sick. And it's like something, something is happening. It's like, I just want to do everything I can to, to not get sick because I don't have time to be sick. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have time for this shit. Yeah, so yeah, very, very keen to. Well, A, boost my immune system as much as possible. B, get my testosterone up as much as I possibly can. Um, and C, just experience that, that regeneration that I feel when I, when I do do that hot, cold stuff. I'm doing, um, I'm doing uh, saunas fairly regularly because we have one at the gym up here. Um, and that feels great. But there's something, there's something very special about the cold stuff. And, uh, and like you're saying, going from, from cold to hot. Yeah, the content. When you get out of the uh, the ice tub, do you put like um, a, like a dressing gown on or anything, or do you just literally stand there and suffer? So it depends on what my desired stimulus is, but I generally try to not put anything on, um, okay. especially if it's a, a cold environment. Like you want to start shivering, you want your body to go there and to experience that. Um, but I experiment a lot with different activities post ice, and so you know I'll I'll work with like isometric holds. And to see like if that generates heat within me, um, I'll, I'll do certain type of, of breath protocols to get like the internal heat going. Um, I'll do exercise immediately after. One of my favorite um, things that I've been doing lately is working with the assault bike and ice. And right. so going from the, like, a, like for instance, like one minute in the ice bath to a max effort on the assault bike and then back and forth and back and forth. Wow. And well, I, I've read a lot of stuff about the, you know, the theory is now that you shouldn't actually ice bath directly after a workout. You should actually ice bath before. And then that transition from cold to working out and your body, like naturally getting its body temperature up is exactly. massive. Yes. For, um, not only muscle growth, but 
hormonally for you know growth hormone and testosterone and all that good stuff uh, it's, it's incredible but it's it's so physically exhausting because it requires yeah. every cell to wake up right. which is also amazing it's, and that's why i think like the ice in general is great for people who might have troubles with insomnia or who might have trouble sleeping because when you ask of your body so much like that just it truly exhausts you and then you sleep like a baby <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm pretty solid. I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> they're not they're not cheap, but you can get them on um, like payments now. You can get them, you know, where you just pay a little bit a month kind of thing. And that I think the cheapest one, the plunge one does, is like five or six grand. Mm-hmm. But you can like, offer an installments kind of thing. Um, and it, although it sounds like a lot of money, and I say this to everybody, it's, it's the same thing with gym memberships. It's like, like what's people, – people will go out for dinners. You know – you go out to dinner in LA, it's going to cost you a hundred bucks. Minimum. <laughs> it's like, if you're doing that like multiple times, you know, uh, a month or probably a week, which some of you in LA do, like, don't tell me you can't afford a gym membership. Like, it's ridiculous. Exactly. Like health and wellness and longevity. It's like, I'm willing to spend money on that stuff because like, that's everything. That's everything. Because yeah. without, like, like your grandma always said, like, without your health, you're nothing. And it's true. If you get fucking sick, it's it sucks. Uh, so I'm willing, I'm willing to, to invest in that. <laughs> well, it's the it's the old adage where it's uh, um, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure or something along those lines. We're just like right. more in the prevention than right. however much money you're going to spend being right. sick. And- exactly. And that's the other thing. We've gotten so caught, caught up with like the cure, like disease and the cure, whereas actually doing preventative measures would have been far more cost effective, far less dangerous with side effects or whatever, uh, and less expensive. We could have just like, you know, prepared ourselves for the shit to come as opposed to just waiting for it to happen and then looking look for the drug to cure it. And that's just become the Western mentality. You know, it's just like, oh, there's a drug to fix that. Don't worry about it. Well, I mean, um, I think that a lot comes with like consumerism in general, you know, just like they're... Uh, consumerism. Yeah advertising that's what it's all about there's no money in preventative measures there's no money in saying you know there's no money for pharmaceutical companies to say yeah have ice baths and go to the gym it's so like you know this is the cynic in me but it's like they almost want people to get sick because that's how they make money um but yeah uh, i did want to ask you uh before, before I, I could talk to you all day before i go um you did a tv show right the <laughs> one in the dark or something was it a tv show Yes. So um, in 2017, I was a part of a survival experiment for the Discovery Channel. And um, the show was called Darkness. And the concept behind it was that you would be marooned in some sort of darkness um, that you would have to kind of navigate your way to the light. Um, and you had up until six days to escape, essentially. And so they did it. It was a series of shows and so of episodes. And so each one featured a different location. Um, but the one that I was in was a cave and it was a, a maze cave. And so the idea is that they dropped me in a cave with no food or light of any kind, no light, like can't see your hand in front of your face. Um, and I have to utilize my faculties to somehow escape this cave. Otherwise that I would lose or, you know, part of it was just, there wasn't like a big prize money kind of thing. It was just escape and it was all infrared technology in terms of capturing the experience. And so the camera could see me, but I couldn't see the camera and it was all mounted throughout the cave. And so you're alone (laughs) and you might meet somebody else down there is what they told me. They're like, there are other people in this cave. And if you, if you find them, you can meet up with them to, to escape, but Otherwise, it's just you. <laughs> so how long were you in that cave for? Um, I ended up being, I did escape in the time that they had rec- allotted. And so I think I was in there for five days and 20 hours. Holy shit. Yeah. No- um, so I had no food the entire time. And they gave me a backpack that had a couple supplies, um, paracord, um, elbow pads, knee pads, a tiny little blanket um, that would barely cover your torso. And then um, two packets of emergency water to use at my discretion. Um, Because they did say, you know, in your travels that you might encounter caches that could have food. It could have materials to make a water filter if you encounter water down there. Um, And so 
I did end up finding one other person in the cave and he had found um, charcoal or what he thought was charcoal and a sock and was able to kind of jimmy rig a, a, a water filter. And so he had one water bottle, like a Nalgene full of water. So a very, very limited supply for the entire time. Um, so that was very mentally, yeah. <laughs> mentally grueling, but also. You like just, okay. I'm sorry. You okay afterwards. I, I, I was, <laughs> um, but as soon as I got out of the cave, there was a psychologist there. And I think there's a psychologist on call too. Um, when I got picked up from the airport for the experience, there was a PA who was, you know, probably like 16 years old and was telling me things that he probably shouldn't have been telling me. But on a previous episode, there was, I think a Marine who had fallen 20 feet in the darkness and had a mental breakdown and had to be removed from the show. And, um, it was very real stakes. Um, and the darkness brings a lot out because it's such a universal fear and you have to use your voice for essentially echolocation to like understand the size of the space that you're in. And, um, if there is a drop, you know, you can get on your hands and knees and try to feel like how, like how low it is, but if you, you can't, you can't see anything. And so it's incredibly scary and intimidating and, you know, you, it's a, a show. So you kind of sign away all of your rights. <laughs> and so anything can happen and you kind of know that they almost want anything to happen and for it to be fearful. <laughs> Did your eyes adapt? Like did you ever see anything or the whole time it was just complete darkness? Um, the only light that I ever saw was when um, static electricity would build up and you'd just get a shock. And uh, so I would actually, and it was actually very cool to see what that shock looks like because you never really see that in 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 your regular life like when you get shocked you feel it but because there's light around you you don't actually see the spark um but that was the only time that i saw light and um to prepare for that i did um sensory deprivation tanks right float lab um and it's so true that your brain really does find a new way of seeing because when you don't have that, your greatest, most prevalent sense, like your, your sense of feeling and your sense of hearing just expand. And I don't know, it just felt like when I was in the cave, I was kind of exploring the caverns of my own mind in a weird way. Like it became a home in this totally weird way where even though it was totally all imaginary, like I felt like I could see. And even though you know, thinking back to my experience in the cave, I couldn't see anything. I have visual memories of it. Wow. It's almost like my brain created it. Did you did you go, did they let you go back into the cave with light afterwards and see what it actually looked like? Um I didn't. I bet I could, but there was a photographer who explored the cave that I was in from Esquire after and he wrote this incredible article and I, he showed me pictures that he took in the cave and I was like wow and he's like this is the room that you were in and this is a little map that you drew on the ground and it was it was pretty crazy to to see it in that way uh, I don't think I would have lasted five days <laughs> but and what so the interesting thing was that um for the first the very first part of that experience they walked me into a room and they're like okay stay here until you hear hear from us again and again again just super dark i was like okay they're probably gonna drop off all the contestants in different um different areas and then, then they'll tell us to go so that way we were all starting at the same time um it ended up being two whole days that they left me alone in that isolation and um one of the things that i knew just from my experience learning about survival is how to, to frame it in your mind, to view it truly as a challenge and not, this is the end all be all like, you know, you're going to be okay. Um, but the thing that I did to keep myself moving was exercise. Mm. Um, I would do squats, you know, I would do <laughs> mobility work. I would, um, I was wearing a helmet. And so I practiced headstands, you know, just like kind of, there's this interesting balance of trying to stay warm, but also knowing I'm not going to have any calories. So I don't want to spend too much energy, but also I want to keep myself entertained and warm. And yeah. at the very end of the show, one of the producers came up to me and he said, you know, everything that we've learned from this show about isolation and how to keep a human sane is exercise. Wow. And That's I thought that was really powerful. Um, did you um, did you have points where you're like, "Fuck this, I'm out," or were you ever tempted to? Could could you even quit? Or how 
Yeah. So they gave us um, each contestant a radio. And so if you want to quit, you had to like blow your whistle three times, call on the radio, and then they would extract you. Um, on my particular episode, there were three people. And um, I only ever met one because the third guy quit after 12 hours. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised, to be honest. I mean, that is, that's fucking serious. It is. And you're super alone with your thoughts and yourself. And if you're not at all comfortable in that, then... I don't know. It was really interesting because the third guy who quit, he was actually the owner of a survival school. And he quoted when he quit, you know, it wasn't the skills that he knew well, you know, because he knows like how to start a fire and he knows how to build shelter. And those aren't things that you can really utilize in those moments. It's just truly your relationship with yourself. And what can you do when you're truly alone? But then also, you know, the challenge of actually navigating you know, you don't have light, you don't have a compass, you have nothing. And so I had paracord. And so I would try to tie the paracord off to like some kind of rock and then use that almost like a tether to go explore and to come back, go explore and come back. Because when you don't have any vision at all, your sense of what is around you just gets confused incredibly fast. You think, oh yeah, I'll, I'll remember I went right here. I went left here. But again, if you can't see how many different rights and lefts there are, and if the cave walls are far apart, you just, it's almost impossible. And so I did uh, a relief map in the ground with rock. I would draw the confines of what I thought were the room. And then I would go pick, I just picked a random exit to start and would go that way and then feel around for an entryway in a different direction. And once I felt, okay, there's a right here. And I think there's a left here. I would go back and then I would draw on my little map and that muscle memory of just doing the same thing over and over and over again, ultimately really helped me. Um, and then the contestant that I did meet, he was an actual caver. <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. Like you're the person, of course, that I would want to meet in this particular scenario. And so his knowledge of cave systems and how they work um, is ultimately what led us out of the cave, you know, just in terms of understanding veins and airflow. And um, if you feel airflow, it means like you're close to the exit. And so learning how to like follow that. And um, we made a really great team because I was chipper and happy and a really good attitude and spirit. Um, and then he had the the scientific knowledge of, of wow. the cave system. And so we really formed an incredible team and ultimately got out. Mm. Do you think yeah. you would, have, um, would you have got out if you hadn't met him? I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I definitely would have, you know, continued. Um, and it's so funny because like, I don't, you know, it's to ask him the same question because I don't know if he had, you right. know, the wherewithal to, to be in there alone and even though he had the knowledge like he could have like very easily collapsed internally which and, kind, of, kind of like brings us back to what we were talking about earlier like people need people uh, you can have all the skills in the world but it's like ultimately you need companionship to to get through it exactly do you, you watch it alone the show alone <laughs> i have seen it yeah, yeah. it's funny because like what you were saying I mean, there's some very, very highly skilled people who can do amazing things, but almost always the thing that gets people in the end is being alone. Like they miss their family or their children or their relationships. And that's what, that's what makes them quit. Um, Sometimes it's hunger and whatever, but usually it's because they just can't deal with being alone, which is the whole point. Really. I mean, and I think about that a lot, this notion that it's much easier to do harder things when you're with people. For sure. Yeah. I, I think about that a lot, like in the mountaineering community, you know, like the, these these tough situations that I find myself in. I'm like, would I be up here like 100% alone, freezing in a tent with the idea of, you know, my life at risk, you know, if I was, was totally alone? It's like, no, absolutely not. But like when you're with people and you push each other and, you know, it doesn't have to be that extreme, but just like even this idea of community at the gym, you know, like you push harder when you're with your friends and yeah. you're working hard and you see them suffering and you're suffering and you kind of like, you know, yeah. do it together. And yeah, that's, again, just to come full circle, that that is the point of of the gym. Like you learn that lesson when you when you suffer through something together, it's it becomes easier. And you you do it you do it better if you're um, if you're left on your own. I mean, I know from being up here, if, you, if you're trying to like a, a really hard metcon on your own, it's never the same as if you're doing with other people. When you're doing with other people. You thrive off their energy. You see them suffering, so you suffer more. And you're just more willing and more more able. You become more able because of the people around you. When you're on your own, it's just never the same same thing. So again, 
by creating that artificially in the gym, it teaches the lesson of what we need really in, in the outside world. So when we go out there, we're, we're better when we're in community, we're better when we're in companionship, we're better in a village, we're better, you know, with, with good people around us. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a fast, such a fascinating human condition, all that stuff. And that's again, that's what I love about the gym. And, and I'm glad that you are, you know, you are making that that kind of conscious awareness of the gym. The gym can be the gym, and it can be gym stuff. But the real the real gift is how that applies to the outside world, and what what skills and lessons you learn in the gym can then be applied to those situations. Um, in, in the outside world, um, yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a, it's a gift. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sarah, if people want to get on this adventure fit and they want to sign up or they want to find out where these adventures are, how do they how do they do that? Um, so we have our website, which is adventurefitla.com, and then also Instagram, social media at adventurefitla. And so I have mailing lists. And so I always um, send those out. But the cool thing about it is that so far, every single time I released a cycle, you know, it's it's sold out in 30 minutes. It's kind of crazy because, again, it's a, it's a very small, intimate thing. I can't do, you know, multiple people wow. at once. And so the idea is to add more cycles. And so following along there and then um, usually I'll release in advance, you know, what the what the cycle is, whether it be backpacking or canyoneering or something along those lines because I find that different activities speak to different people um and then, um so for 2023 um the first one will be a backpacking trip um in early spring um haven't decided on the location yet but that will be the the planned activity and it's a five-week cycle um but I'll release more information there and um Usually it's slightly specific to location in terms of um, I work out of gyms or I, I partner with um, corporations too to do like more leadership team building stuff as well. And so some of some of them are advertised, some of them are a little bit more internal, um, but it's an incredible program and I'm very excited to share. What about the photography stuff? Are you completely freelance or? Yeah, all freelance. And how do people find out uh, your photography? Um, so for my photography, um, my personal Instagram is usually where I post most of that. So at Sarah Sky Ann, S-A-R-A-H-S-K-Y-A-N-N. -N. And then my photography website is skywilliamsphotography.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, honestly, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I love that conversation. I love everything that you're doing. I think you can be very proud of it. What you're doing is very important. Um, it's a, like I said, it's, it's a real, a real, thing of purpose, a real uh, purposeful uh, pursuit. And I think it, it's going to help a lot of people, going to help a ton of people. And um, I'm excited to see what happens with that. I'd love to come on one of your, one of your adventure fit journeys. I think it'd be awesome. I want to hire a while. <laughs> like there's some really good hikes up here you can, you can yeah. do. Um, so yeah, you must come up and visit. Amazing. I'll try and get that, that ice bath when you come up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, guys, thanks for listening in. Um, as you've heard, you can reach out to Sarah in the, in the links that she sent, but we will put the links um, at the bottom of the, the page as well so you can easily connect with her um, while we're doing. Uh, guys, we are open in both Echo Park and in Idlewild now, Paris Athletic Club. Um, Paris Athletic Club Idlewild is a smaller sister to the LA Gym, but it's a fantastic club. Come check it out if you're up in Idlewild. Um, we'll be back with you again shortly and we'll connect soon. Take care, guys. Thank you.